everyone. Welcome to our third Forum Fireside. I am grateful to see so many of you. I'm so sad that we're not meeting in person at the Forum in Amsterdam. I may have some news on that later. But I'm really glad that we can be here and I'm delighted to introduce you to our guests. I have a personal stake in our guests because they're really cool people and I like them very much. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Michael Porcelli and Josh Zamel of Bedrock Culture and Leadership. Hey, Porch. Hey. Hey, Josh. Hey, everybody. So let me give you let me give you the the bite sized version of Porch and Josh's bio, although the whole version is incredibly long and impressive. Uh, Porch and Josh are founding partners at Bedrock Culture and Leadership, as Holacracy works on the organizational side of rule sets and, and how roles work together. Better Our Culture and Leadership is particularly cool because they work with the human side of organizations and Josh and Porch provide facilitation and education really focused on interpersonal communication and group dynamics at the, at the heart, the human level. So their particular focus is on fostering healthy cultures, particularly in self-managed and decentralized organizations. So it's no wonder that Bedrock Culture and Leadership and Holacracy One are deeply connected. Uh, Porch and Josh met at the Integral Center, Boulder, Colorado. Did I get that right in Boulder? That's right. Yes. And uh, Porch was actually the Holacracy adoption lead there among his many roles. And Josh was a course leader at the Integral Center and has been a growth strategist and communication consultant uh, for many years. They have together delivered hundreds, hundreds of trainings on topics like sensitive conversations, which is what we're gonna focus on today. And uh, I can't wait to share with you a little later today about a new venture that uh, Bedrock Culture and Leadership and Holacracy One are working on. Some of you I'm sure know already, but uh, we'll talk more about that later. So gentlemen, thank you for being here, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be thank here. You. Thanks for having us, yeah. it's really nice. Be so here. before I jump into a, an exhaustive list of questions, which unfortunately I don't think I'll be able to get to all of them, I want to remind our participants that if you'd like to ask a question, please do so in the chat. I'll be monitoring it and I'll get to as many as I can. We will share a recording of this session uh, a little later after uh, the session and we clean it up. So if you missed part of it or you want to listen to something again, we'll send that out. So, uh, gentlemen, any other any other administrative concerns before I kick this off? Ready to awesome. go. Thank you. Okay, so Porch, I want to start with you because uh, you and I have talked about this. The three of us talked about this session and what we wanted out of it. And I know you've been giving this a lot of thought lately. Can you maybe take us through some of your observations of conversations that are potentially charged, especially lately with news topics like racial justice, social justice. Um, there's recent body cam footage from police officers that's coming out. Uh, there, there is so much going on, not to mention, oh, global pandemic. Maybe could you share some observations you've had recently uh, about your conversations with colleagues and friends? Yeah. Uh well, I think that, you know, even the, in an election season, things normally get more charged here in the United States and uh, more topics be, have become polarizing and the conversations tend to become more quickly polarized between what one position and another position. I'm going to try to speak to this in general terms without kind of taking sides on any one particular issue because what's more interesting to me is the way the discourse works. So when it, topics become polarized in this way, people become more emotionally reactive, they become more entrenched in their positions, uh, maybe they focus more on like, you know, sharing in small provocative sound bites or signaling in some way like who's on my team versus who's on the opposite team and and that sort of thing and 
not everybody is doing that. Another thing that I find is maybe even for the majority of people, they will hold back when they sort of see and experience these kind of conversations going in that direction so much more often. They might be like, well, I, I sort of have a nuanced view or maybe I can see multiple sides of a particular issue, but I'll just stay on the sidelines. I will maybe self-censor or not talk openly about what I care about or value. And then when people end up in, if you find yourself in that position, like you will actually start disconnecting, maybe even cordoning yourself off. I know sometimes this summer, I've just spent way more time off of social media, which is often a source of connection with people. But now I found like, I can feel like I'm barely comment on a thing without suddenly it just escalating into a thing that I'm like, oh, this is toxic. I want to get away from it. So then that creates a kind of downward pressure on our sense of connection with each other. Now there's one side of this, which is like our, even our, our ability to make sense of what's happening factually and to maybe figure out what we should be supporting policy wise or politically or something. Maybe that feels like it gets hampered, which is a, another major issue, but we're going to center on the effect on your relationships, which I actually think has people feel more lonely, more disconnected, more deprived of the kind of relatedness that we need as social beings. And that I think, especially in the time of COVID is really a, a major cost socially. I think we'll look back and see that this has been a very difficult period for a lot of people in this way. Thanks, Porch. Josh, uh, anything to add here? I think Porch nailed it, Rebecca. So, so why don't why don't we bank this time and get to the next one and and see where it goes? Okay, I'm gonna spend it well <laughs> on other stuff. Uh, awesome. So, uh, but Josh, I do want to kind of ask you specifically. So Porch yep. has mentioned kind of some of these fractals of this happens and then this happens and and we, we shut down or we can't make sense. Can you maybe break down for us, huh, ironically, break down for us how some of these conversation breakdowns happen? Yeah. You know, what, what's going on when, when these things that Porch men mentioned, what's happening there and, and what do we do? Yeah, cool, great question. There's a few things that Porch and I, you know, have tracked, have, have talked a lot about that we noticed that, that kind of contribute to breakdown in conversation. Um, I'll highlight one for now. One thing is like people expressing their opinions as though they were facts. So maybe that already sounds familiar to, to, to some of you listening. You already know what I'm talking about, but it's a matter of making arguable claims stated as though they were absolutes or stated with total certainty. Um, this could be about like the topic at hand, or it could be about uh, other people or even the people in the conversation. So maybe statements like this might sound familiar. Like if, if I were to say like, what you're failing to see is that dot, 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 or people who don't wear masks don't care about other people, right? Which I, maybe I believe that, but I'm stating it as though it's a fact and it's a, you know, not a directly observable claim that I can really back up. So it might incite reactivity or so-and-so this or that politician is only in it for the whatever, the money, the power, whatever. So anytime you say something that's arguable as though it's definitely true, it's likely to be provocative. At least that's what I've found. You're likely to elicit opposition, maybe reactivity from anyone who thinks even slightly differently, or even anybody who doesn't like the fact that you made such a blanket claim, even if they don't disagree. Now, I, I'll, I'll say that maybe sometimes you're kind of preaching to the choir. So maybe sometimes if you're with, you know, people who definitely agree, it's fun to kind of call a politician or this or that or something like that. So, you know, there's some nuance here, or maybe you're actually looking to be provocative, like you're looking to generate buzz online. But I'm assuming that, you know, for people on this call, there are, you know, you're familiar with some situations where you're interested in 
you know, preserving a feeling of connection and healthy dialogue with people in, on sensitive topics, you might be in a sensitive environment, like in a workplace or a family occasion or on social media. So in that case, you know, that's a pitfall that we see that, that we could, that I could recommend avoiding. So thanks. All right. So sometimes we can't avoid these conversations. Uh, yeah. And I'm thinking particularly when we are, you mentioned family gatherings, when we're, when we're with family and in, sometimes, especially today, we could be stuck inside with family in, and, and not be able to escape. <laughs> and oh, another right. situation I'm thinking of is in the workplace. You have a colleague who you consider a friend and you have, you have to work with that person. You, can't, you can voice an exit, but you still, you have to work with them. So in the event of these breakdowns, can you share a solution with us? What's something practical that we can do as individuals to move forward when this happens? Well, one thing, I mean, just, just to kind of share the solution for the, you know, pitfall, kind of the turnaround that I just, just the turnaround for the, 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 the breakdown point that I just mentioned is, you know, we sometimes talk about speaking inarguably um, as owning one's experience, owning your experience or owning your perspective. So that involves using objective language to talk about objective things and using subjective language to talk about subjective things like what someone else's motivations might be or about your own feelings. So instead of like, if you're not wearing a mask, you don't care about other people, you could say like, I wish everyone would wear a mask, especially indoors. I sometimes wonder what drives people not to do that. Um, like I wonder whether they're really caring about other people. So if you could see how that's different, I focused on my own subjective experience. I shared about my wish. I shared about my wondering. Here's, here's another example. Okay, I have this friend who doesn't recycle um, in his house. So, you know, when I'm over there, I'm like, or I was like, and I see that other people say this to him too. It's like, oh, where can I recycle this, you know, bottle or whatever. And he's like, I don't have one. I don't recycle here. So I was surprised by that. And if I said something like, you know, plastic waste is a big deal. You know, I'm making an arguable claim. Even if I believe, even if I believe it strongly, it's a subjective assessment that somebody could disagree with. On top of that, I'm implying pretty much that he doesn't think plastic waste is a big deal, which I also don't know to be true. So what if instead I was like, wow, I feel surprised. I really care about the planet and recycling's pretty important to me. Why don't you recycle? So focus on my own experience, get curious about his perspective. And what I found out is that he actually cares about the planet too. And he actually has reasons for believing that recycling has a net negative impact on the environment which is not something I ever would have thought of, but he gave me some reasons for it. I still recycle in my home, but I now have the benefit of having learned about this other perspective. And I also don't feel any less close to him after any of that. I actually feel more close. So there's one, there's one tip for you, is own your perspectives. That's awesome, Josh. And you and I have talked about this a lot. Uh, yeah. I think I've mentioned it to you. It's, it's how we get from, I call it shooting all over ourselves and other people. You should recycle right. versus bringing it back to the direction to ourselves of recycling is important to me. And yes. here's why. Here's how I yeah. feel. I love that. Yeah. Porch, I want to, I want to shift to you and I want to give you the, the, the tricky one. Okay. Yeah, right. So I, okay. I would love, <laughs> this is, this is, super useful i think both uh, to everyone here and as we all work together i would love more of and maybe another example of a process you would recommend or another solution to these breakdowns and i want to throw in the dynamic of disparate power particular it could be personal power that person is your landlord they control the social group that you're in or you're in a workplace and this person has power over your job, your work, your salary. How does the, does the dynamic change? And maybe it's no, 
uh, and if it's yes, how, and then how can we accept responsibility and what's maybe a practice you would recommend when there is a power disparity? Wow. So a power disparity and, you know, I think it intensifies the issue. Um, it can make, you know, I know sometimes I have felt a power disparity in relationship with somebody where I felt they were like power up and I was in the power down position. And, you know, that sometimes would make it harder for me to even remember the points that I wanted to make <laughs> to, with the person, or it made it easier for me to just kind of collapse and go along with them. Um, and, you know, sometimes in the power over position, when somebody's in a power down, I, I'm aware of that, that power dynamic. I need to go a little bit of an extra mile in a way to let the person know that I really hear and understand them before going on to make my point. Because oftentimes when I'm in the power up position, I will feel like it's just easy for me to say what I think. And, you know, sometimes people won't even, like they may be in the position of just going along with what they hear me saying because they want to curry favor with me. So it pays, I think, to slow down. Some of the solutions really do end up looking the same, but I'm going to focus in on this listening one. Um, so, you know, sometimes we will listen uh, in either power position, but like I'm going to focus on being in the power up position. Like, it, like I am listening in order to think of the counterpoint that I'm going to make, right? I'm listening. I'm, I'm almost like in my mind like ahead in the conversation. I'm like, okay, they're saying this and now I'm going to say this other thing to like make my point. Uh, instead of being with the person, doing something more like what is known as active listening or empathic listening. Um, there's different kinds of empathy, cognitive empathy, emotional empathy. And in those conversations, I find it's helpful to, as they're talking, signal that I'm, I'm hearing them. I think I get what you're saying. That makes sense to me. I get how you would feel that way or think that. Uh, and then another thing is to repeat back to them keywords, either direct keywords uh, or paraphrase them in some way. So I might say something like, so what I hear you saying is, or something that I think I'm getting. Yeah, read a here post, listening to understand. Yes, listening to understand rather than to be listening in order to win or to make your counterpoint. Uh, so in this, let's just say uh, there's this uh, recycling thing happening I might say so so you think so you think potentially there's a greater negative environmental impact to recycling than to not recycle right and that person might be like yeah you get me and they might even start sharing with me more about their reasoning for that and you know then I might hear their explanation and maybe they said something about you know more trucks and more emissions or more fossil fuels burned and I'd be like so okay I got it I think so recycling requires this extra, you know, these extra cans in front of your homes and on different truck. And now you have two trucks arriving rather than just one. And, you know, they're burning fuel and there's this whole other thing happening. The person's like, yeah, totally. Right. So I'm letting them know it's not just me hearing and understanding, but sharing with them my understanding in such a way that they know that I get them. We call that shared reality. So shared reality is a capacity we all have, and it's actually the basis of our social world. We both know that we both know what my perspective is. We both know that we both know what your perspective is, even when our perspectives are different than each other's. It's like actually a, it's a particular kind of psychological state called shared reality that's super crucial. And these kind of conversations of active listening create more shared reality. And then I could take one, I'll give one more tip. You, once you get there, you can actually do a thing called a steel man or steel person uh, where you attempt to make their point just as good, if not better, than they made it. And you might even say, now this, imagine how surprising it might be to hear something like this on social media saying, saying, so let me see if I can make your point even stronger and then try to make it stronger. So let's just say this uh, recycling thing is happening the person may make their point about trucks and I'm saying, yeah. And I can imagine there's this whole set of recycling plants that themselves need to be built 
and staffed and power needs to go to those things. And there's potentially emissions from those things or smelting going on in there and so forth. The person's like, yeah, exactly. Right. So now not only did I get them, I have actually bolstered their argument, uh, which is another kind of technique for essentially de-escalating this kind of charge and polarization dynamic that I talked about at the beginning. This is great. And uh, Josh, I want to give you an opportunity to pop in here, but I want to add maybe one more dynamic. There was a lovely question here kind of to add to this. So uh, I, and correct me if I'm wrong here, this is operating this these tips some of it you have to hope that the other party is in some way enrolled in in at least letting you get their world and there's a question here so how do you challenge differing views in the power disparity situation especially from a power down position if the power up is is really not enrolled because they don't have to be there is you know there is no intrinsic motivation or you know whatever whatever the situation is but they're they're not willing for whatever reason to listen empathically to get your world um josh i maybe want to start with you on this one and then porch let you jump back in or if the two of you want to riff off each other we've got time yeah thanks rebecca this is a really good one so it's a little bit of a version of like, well, what happens if, if a conversation on a charge topic or some kind of sensitive conversation is not working for one reason or another? This reason is because it seems like the person you're speaking with, you know, isn't wanting to play by the same, you know, set of contexts of, you know, curiosity, seeking mutual understanding, preserving connection that you seem to want to play by. And anytime there is that kind of a mismatch, or it seems like there is to you, and it's having some impact on you, I'll just speak about myself. When that's happening for me, I like to reveal my, my personal experience. So this is a moment in the conversation to sort of go relational, what we call, you know, actually go explicitly into the relational mode, which is when I'm putting attention, not on the topic, but actually on what's happening in the relationship, on my experience in being in the relationship. So, you know, revealing my present moment experience of myself, that doesn't mean revealing my experience of them necessarily. That even can be incendiary. Like I'm experiencing you as, you know, being activated or something like that, right? That's, that's a, almost in the territory of making kind of a claim about them. But I notice I'm feeling surprised about your perspective, a little charge in this conversation. And I also feel concerned that we're not on the same page about what our intentions even are in this conversation. Here are mine, this might be step two, would be kind of move into kind of resetting or setting the intention or the context of the conversation. So reveal number one, number two, reiterate to the kind of context and make something explicit about what you're wanting. You know, so my main interests in this conversation are for us to understand one another's perspectives while also continuing to feel connected in a sense of, you know, mutual care and respect. Um, so, okay, then what are you going to do next? You might check to see whether they're on board with that context. Or you might actually propose an, an yet another move of like a, um, a generosity of, of active listening or steel man or you know, so I wonder if this might be a good time for me to really see if I can put myself in your shoes a bit more and tell you what I think I'm getting about your perspective. So reveal, reset context, and then make a move of humility toward their side of the street. But maybe you don't even get that far because it just really, you know, becomes clear, at least you have the impression through those, some of those moves that, well, they're wanting something different in the conversation. And then you can reveal about that. And it's possible that, you know, a conversation ends without you having, you know, achieved a greater sense of connection with somebody. You might believe that it's because they weren't available to do that. And then you got to think about what you want to do about that, you know, next, you know, and, and, and how you want to revisit that potentially. Um, but it doesn't necessarily need to happen in the same conversation as, you know, talking about some charged news topic or even work topic. 
That's, thank you, Josh, that's great. I, I feel myself, like, I feel weight because I experience that as, as needing so much bravery and vulnerability and it's not a set of muscles that everyone has. I, I, that I, I, I'm building it. Porch, you and I have talked pretty extensively about uh, how some, myself included, can experience this type of relating and, and type of, of connecting as exhausting. <laughs> um, and part of it is because it's a, it's a set of muscles to build. So particularly when it comes to, as Josh mentioned, revealing your own experience to someone who maybe is not enrolled in connecting the way you are. And that, that feels to me very vulnerable and, and scary. So is there, are, are there some baby steps? What are, what are some, some baby steps to try this out? Uh, what might be a safe, a safer place to do this? Or, um, or, or I almost want to say, can you give, give us a pep talk? Because this sounds like this is, it takes a lot of bravery and vulnerability and I wish everyone would communicate this way, but it's, it's tough. Yeah. Porch is always a good person to ask for a pep talk. So call there. <laughs> right? I do it a lot. <laughs> that is my experience as well. <laughs> Guys. Um, yeah. So I'll just riff on a few things that come to mind immediately. Like just in general, what you said is true. It is, it is potentially a new muscle for folks. And sometimes it requires repetition. You just need to do it more. And sometimes doing it more to get those reps in sort of like lifting weights. You don't put all the, you know, you don't go for like lifting the huge amount of weight. You want to lift a small amount of weight. So this is a way to get there. Um, one is to pick a topics, pick topics that have less charge to start with, maybe where there's a little bit less at stake or pick uh, relationships that you feel like you have a huge amount of trust already established and earned and practice with that person, potentially about a smaller topic. Um, another thing you might do is rehearse. Sometimes I will, I will do this. I'll be like, uh, you know, hey, can you just be like that person for me for a second so I can just talk it out? So I give the person a little bit of a background. Or sometimes I will do that in reverse as a, as a consultant or coach, facilitator. Like, okay. They'll describe to me a difficult relational situation or dynamic, and I'll be like, all right, let's mock this up. I'll be that person. You try to do it. And then we can be like, okay, time out. What just happened there? Like, we sort of de debug and just have an experience of trying to say those things out loud. Sometimes it can just help be helpful if you, especially if you have a lot of emotional charge about a thing, is to journal about it or to vent with another person. You know, you might want to spew all your judgmentality or or charge that you're not owning your experience the way that josh talked about earlier just to get it off your chest which actually kind of creates some headspace to be able to then figure out how to own it better and bring it in that way these are all little techniques but i mean i think the major thing is to if you have the ability to rely on like a repeatable process that somebody else like us has like developed i think it's a really good idea like to you know so i've had friends uh former students they they've told me some of the, the the handouts or the you know protocols they they printed them out and they handed them to their whole team and they reported back like this was great we just followed your steps and it was like they sort of relied on it sort of similar to how people kind of rely on that tactical meeting process for holacracy or that governance meeting process it's like well, somebody else has done a lot of the work to get that there. And sometimes just having a reliable process rather than feeling like, oh, it's all just up to my own oomph, like, you know, to make it happen. Thanks, uh, Porch. So, so Josh, let's, let's say um, I have taken some steps. I have rehearsed. I have planned. I've journaled. I've done a few other things. I'm, I've prepared myself for a difficult conversation and I'm feeling okay, I start to get into it and I notice myself getting upset. And in the moment, I'm feeling charged and 
I'm not now in a place where, okay, let me be the steel man. Let me, really what I want to do at that moment is vent and, and spew judgment. <laughs> but that's probably, it may not be the best idea. What do I do in that moment? Is, can you give me a recommendation? What can I do when I am feeling like this, you know, forget it. I'm just gonna, I'm reverting back to spewing judgment. <laughs> You're muted. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize. So much of it, Rebecca, depends on the nature of your relationship with this particular person. Um, you know, there's a lot of situations I might be in where I have a lot of background of relationship with this person. And so, you know, I or you might be able to swing out a little bit more self-expressively after setting context for it. Like, again, I super duper recommend, you know, starting with some, some reveal of what's happening, right? And then saying what you would like to happen next. Reveal, set context for what, like you, you, what you would like to happen next and see if they're on board for it. And then if they are, do it. Now, what that thing is totally depends. Right. So it's, um, you know, in some situations, and this is the one where, like I was speculating, you might have a strong background of relatedness with this person. Right. It's like, oh, my God, Rebecca, I'm noticing I'm getting supercharged as I'm talking with you about this. And I totally really care about our friendship and our connection. And ultimately, I do want to understand your perspective on this. But for the moment, can I just like like vent about this topic and call you names or like go like blah or this sucks i really right like can i do stuff like that and and then do that right that might be one variety of relationship that you and i if it was you and me i probably would feel comfortable to do something like that um and i'd love to hear what names you'd call me i think i, <laughs> I would love that <laughs> right so there's there's that whole thing there's a more mild version would just be like and maybe this is less background of relatedness is present. It's like, um, yeah, so I notice I'm getting like a little activated in this conversation. I guess there's something I'm really caring about here. I don't feel like we're totally on the same page yet. And I'm, I do really care about our friendship or our colleagueship and all of that. It would be really helpful to me if you could tell you, tell me what you think I'm, uh, tell you, Yep, yep, yep. Tell me what you think you're getting about my perspective in this moment. Um, that would be that would be feel really settling for me to know that I'm being heard in what I've said. Right. So you could actually just make a request of them that they actively listen or they kind of steal man. There's those. And then outside of any of that, there might be situations where again, start with the reveal. Start with that you're caring about something here, set context, what, and then, but the next move is actually, could we come back to this later? Like, I, I'd, I'd love to take a time out so that I can kind of collect my thoughts and come back to this conversation in a more open-minded way at some point later. That would be I another move. I love that. Move. It's so easy. And I wonder if sometimes I, we forget, you know, we could just hit pause and go and punch a pillow and come back. And it's fine. <laughs> Especially now that we probably are in our homes at our desks where our pillows are upstairs and or somewhere else. Um, there is a question in the chat that I think is quite interesting and it got upvoted. So I wanna bring it in here because it also, it, it, it works. So you've done this and you're, the other party is uh, enrolled, but they are assuming that the shared reality is also also means agreement that oh okay if you if you're and porch maybe this speaks to uh the steel man example you brought up oh if you can argue my point you must agree with me uh -huh. what what do you do what if someone assumes that a shared reality also means agreeing with them yeah 
Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a number of ways to approach it. If it sort of seems like that's what's happening, you could just call it out. I could be like, oh, it sounds like what you, sounds like you think I agree with you now. I don't. <laughs> Let me just share with you how I don't agree with you. Um, do you get that? And sometimes that can be very disarming. Like when I first experienced this on the receiving end, like I, it was kind of amazing. I would just be like making my point and making my point. The person's like, yeah, this and that, and I get this and I get why you would think that. And I suddenly, my, I just sort of felt like a whole bunch of relaxation in my mind. I was like, they must totally just be on board with what I'm saying now. And the person would just go like, yeah, I don't agree with that. And I would just be like, what? You know, no, so I, like, can you talk about the feeling of, of, of that? <laughs> to be on the receiving end of that? Yeah, maybe, maybe the, 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 it's almost like the big reveal. Oh, this didn't all mean that I agreed with you. Like, what is that experience? Yeah, yeah. It's, well, if it's done well, like the way I just suggested, it, it was like, it can be profound. I mean, I don't, I don't even know what it was. I was like, I just was like, there was nothing to push against. There was no sense that, oh, I needed to go back to make my point better. I was like, oh, you know, that idea of Aikido and the martial arts, you sort of use their energy, you know, their direction, their force. And I'm like, somebody just did that with me. So I was like, I just became kind of like, okay, I'm now interested. Tell me what, I'm just kind of curious what, if, if you could really get me to that level and still not agree with me, I, I want to know how that's even possible, right? Like, talk to me. So it naturally evoked curiosity in me. Um, and, you know, this is, it's really not all that crazy. I mean, people, we have this kind of turn of phrase, like, we just agree to disagree. Oh, we just agreed to disagree. And the people kind of know what that means, you know, but like, if, if you're, if you're really taking a leadership in how the conversation unfolds, which if you have the skill and the learning to be able to do that, you can. And sometimes I will very much do that with people where it's like, is there more? Is there more? And I can just like getting them again. They're just like, you're getting me, you're getting me. And you could, I could just see them de-escalate and they're just suddenly almost like run out of things to say. And then I'll be like, cool. So I don't totally agree with all of that. Let me share with you what I think. You open to that. And suddenly it's like, they don't have anything else to say. Right? They feel like they said all their things and they're ready to listen. It's I trippy. Love it. I yeah. love it. Josh, anything to add? No, I think that's, I think we're doing great on that topic. I really enjoyed what Porch had to say. Awesome. I'd like to pivot a little bit. Um, thinking, you know, more specifically right now in our world, our global community, what I, I imagine that some of the most difficult conversations right now are relating to diversity, inclusion, social justice, economic disparity. And so those issues don't just confine themselves to social media and social gatherings. They can come into the workplace, uh, particularly when there's new topics that uh, people are talking about and things they're observing that or personally experiencing and relating to each other that can that there's charge and you bring that with you. Um, can you suggest ways specifically in the workplace uh, to deal with those kinds of situations? Yeah, thanks for bringing this one up. I imagined we would get here because sometimes it's not just about stuff out there. It's about stuff that's happening maybe even to you or you're observing it happen to somebody that you care about and you want to feel like you, you can do something about that. And um, I feel like treading lightly and being sensitive to this topic because it may be evocative for some people right now. Um, first, I'll say most companies have some kind of so I want to acknowledge some kind of some kind of standard of business conduct or agree employment agreement or this kind of thing or maybe even there's services that the HR department provides. If you know of what those things are, I think it's just worth you know tracking that, maybe refreshing that. Um, whatever the procedure is, you don't want to get into trouble if you've signed a piece of paper or something like that. And I think there is, especially when sensitive topics like this come up be a tendency to, to escalate things 
sooner rather than later. Like I got to go talk to whatever reporting thing or my manager or HR or whoever. And the more that that happens, the more people sort of feel unsafe to really bring it up with each other or the more that they tend to just not bring it directly to the other person, the more over time the generic, the culture becomes more generic, becomes more bureaucratic, things become like more one size fits all, it will feel more restrictive to more people, like lowest common denominator kind of thinking, and people will feel less likely to bring their whole selves to work, um, and more like they're doing that self-censorship thing. So the, the, my main piece of advice for now uh, is, you know, if you, especially if you have a, the skill capacity developed or a process that's reliable for it, is to go direct before escalating. Go directly to the other person. And this is what we mean in our work is like addressing a relational tension with someone. We're not, I'm not addressing, it's not like you and me, Rebecca, are talking about what we just saw in the news cycle. You and me are now talking about something that transpired between you and me. So that's what makes it a relational tension. And, you know, as, as with organizational tensions, relational tensions can have more than one kind of pathway to, to process them at a basic level. You know, I might um, be wanting to just ad address one single event between you and maybe I just want to create some mutual understanding as to what was happening there. And usually that's a good starting place. Let's get some shared reality about that. It's the, it's the difference between I'm going to give you feedback about your behavior versus I'm going to share what this was like for me, what meaning I gave to it, what my experience was like. And now I'm also interested in hearing what it was like for you, getting that shared reality thing going. And maybe that's all it needs. Maybe there might be some like one time request. Hey, can we do X, Y, or Z, you know, to like put a cap on that or, you know, can I buy you a coffee, make amends for a thing. There may be sort of a one time action or you might see that there's a, this is an example of an ongoing pattern of interaction between us. So we might want to create like, hey, can we just make a working agreement between the two of us? And I actually had at the Integral Center, we kind of had our baseline set of agreements that applied to everybody, but I basically had custom relationships, designs with different people in different contexts, in different moments. And some of those things were like ongoing. And it was pretty cool. And this actually maps just to do a little holacracy thing here. There's a thing in the, uh, the holacracy version five constitution called working agreements, which is where you and another person can make an agreement about an ongoing set of behaviors that you want to have rather than uh, agreements between roles, like what governance normally is. So those are two basic things to like do a one-time action, address a particular event, and maybe create an ongoing working agreement. And there's a lot more uh, ways to do that that are part of this upcoming training that we're doing. With, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I have a story that you're like trying to, to get, like you're, you're re very respectful of not wanting to go there if we're not ready to go there. We're totally ready to go there. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Um, yeah. you, let me, yeah. Perhaps I could share what you were alluding to. <laughs> yes. Cool. All right. So uh, also, it just, it's just perfect, perfect timing because there was a question in the chat from Samir. You've mentioned a few things. You've mentioned working agreements and processes in place. And there's it's a lot to remember from an hour and 15 minute webinar. So it's almost like we need some sort of education on these processes, which you have already built. We do not have to recreate the wheel. Um, uh, poor, or actually, Josh, would you maybe like to tell us a little bit about uh, the upcoming shared creation between Bedrock Culture and Leadership and Holacracy One? And I happen to know that uh, Meg is ready to share a link when you want. And you're, oh. Yep. Muted again. Thank you. I yeah. see that, thank you. I, I muted because I was laughing out loud at some of the stuff that Porch was saying, and I didn't want to over <laughs> <laughs> override his audio. Um, so yeah, 
the upcoming meta relating training um, is the, the design of it is such that at the end of the training, you have access to more of the kind of relationship that you want to have with anyone. So if you want to feel more connected, you certainly have access to that. If you want to have more influence, you have access to that. If you want to create more efficiency in your working relationships, right, and do some uh, uh, re resolve relational tensions so that your working relationships and your role-to-role -role communications go more smoothly, that's certainly part of what we're we're designing the course around. Because all, all of those things have in common, sometimes putting attention on the relationship, going into the kind of relational mode or relational dimension. So that might be, I think Porch mentioned this, giving feedback to somebody in a way that they're most likely to hear you and take it in. You'll learn that in the course. Or um, maybe how to clear the air between you and somebody else after something is difficult, uh, difficult has happened. Or navigating complex social dynamics in the workplace, like we were just talking about. Um, so for all these outcomes, we've designed the course so that if you come to Meta Relating, we'll offer you both uh processes step by steps to accomplish these kinds of things quickly and effectively and some capacities to go along with those processes like ways of being ways you can practice showing up values you can keep in mind and how you're showing up skills like owning your perspective you know as a way of being or as a way of speaking Right. And you get coaching on how to practice these things in your actual life, in your actual or in your actual workplace, whatever you want during the course, if you want to, and then come back and share about it, you know, share about how it went. So that's a little bit about the design. We would absolutely love to play with you in this course. Um, me and Porch are going to be on staff. Um, Brian Robertson of Holacracy One is going to be on staff and uh, probably some others as well. And yeah, Porch and I have led you know thousands of people through relational development trainings but this is the first time we're offering one in partnership with holacracy one and because it's it's new in this fashion it's being offered at prototype pricing maybe like about half of what we're imagining there might be offered out in the future um the format of the course is seven three and a half hour sessions on zoom over the course of october um, plus uh, optional office hours each week with Porch and myself. Um, pricing is $9.95. There are a limited number of early bird seats at $8.95. So I recommend grabbing one of those if you want one. There's a fair number of people on this call. So I imagine those might go real soon. And yeah, I can turn it over to Meg. Meg put the link in there. Um, Meg says, I'm biased, of course, but I think the practices are incredible. So, Rebecca, did I say everything you wanted to be said about that? And, and more, Rebecca. That was awesome. You're, you're, the, you're the best advertising I could have asked for. Um, <laughs> I do want to highlight one thing both of you has, have mentioned in terms of these processes. Uh, at Holacracy One, we are particularly fortunate because we've been the guinea pigs <laughs> um, for some of these analogous processes. And since I have to imagine that some of our audience is not currently practicing holacracy, uh, parenthetically, yes, the recording will be available, unparenthetically. Um, one thing that I think particularly useful if you are familiar with holacracy practice as a rule set is you've built this amazing resource uh, that remind, that's uh, reminiscent of the tactical meeting card. In, in tactical meetings, we have pathways to process things. We can make requests, we can set an expectation, and that's in the relational space. But what I love about some of the content you're going to cover in the meta-relating training is you've built analogous processes for those pathways in the relational space. So for those of us who are coming from a perspective of self-management and holacracy practice, I found it comforting to pull from a toolbox I already have, but in a different dimension. So yeah, I'm super excited about this. I'm attending to support it logistically, but that means I get to be there. So it's really fun. Um, so I want to leave that. There's, there's information on our website. 
I would love to open it up. We have just under, tw just about 20 minutes. Uh, in addition to putting questions in chat, which I would love to have, uh, well, I give Porch and Josh maybe each an opportunity to share anything else they think they want to share at, right now. Uh, please also use the function of raised hands if you'd like to, to share your voice with us. We'd love to hear you, hear your questions. So I will be looking in the participant list for raised hands if you have a question you'd like to share in real time, or feel free to type your question in the chat. And Porch and Josh, I want to give you each an opportunity. Anything else surfacing for you that you'd like to share? Uh, Porch, let's start with you. I yeah, don't mean I, this is like a closing round, but just space. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to riff a little bit on, you know, some of this stuff that you, you and Josh just said about, you know, kind of the origins of this meta-relating training that we're calling it is, you know, as the practitioner of these relational practices, a teacher of them at the integral center, they become, they became kind of like our background in our culture. And then we used holacracy as our operational procedure and the two of them together went really well. And in the back of my mind this whole time, I was thinking like, what does good culture and relational practice look like in self-organized and self-directed self-governed organizations like holacracy powered organizations? Because it seems like the solution needs to be, you know, in tune with or in alignment with, with that underlying, uh, some of the underlying principles of holacracy, like, like the power shift. So I think a, a power shifted culture is different in some ways than a kind of maybe more top down, you know, human resources imposed culture, like always do it this way or never do it that way, or, you know, secret reporting hierarchies up to the lawyers and this kind of thing. I'm like, wait, this is, it will look different, but there, if you just leave it blank and you don't do anything, uh, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. So something will fill in there. And in my mind, I was like, well, I want that thing that is the healthy, bottom-up, power-shifted, agency-centered culture to be the set of practices that would go there. And I think that's been kind of our guiding design principle behind creating this. I love it. I, I can't wait. Josh, uh, to you, anything else surfacing that you'd like to share? One is just a, maybe the only one is just, a, I wanted to say a logistical thing, which is I, I realize the link for the course is a little bit, you know, uh, it might be hard to remember. So if, if it's, if, if you don't click it now and you want to find it later, it's easy to find on the Holacracy, you know, website under trainings. I just wanted to say that. Um, but I, I would also, yeah, I would also echo the same territory, you know, Porcelli and I have been holacracy practitioners for for quite a while, for even longer than me. Um, and what, what, I'll just say it this way: you know, one of one of my favorite aspects of holacracy is the repeatable processes, right down to you know having a reference card, you know, for the precisely for possible pathways to accomplish an outcome that you might endeavor upon, you know, at a tactical meeting. And what we've done is we've been able to take our best of breed relational practices that we've developed and noticed, but, you know, kind of collated. I shouldn't say developed so much as, you know, observed what works best. And we've kind of broken them down into similar pathways. Like literally we have a, a, a card that has been designed that looks, you know, very parallel to the pathways, to the, you know, attention processing pathways that you might get at a, at a Holacracy tactical meeting, except that it's for what you, you know, how you might be looking to share something with somebody relationally, how you might be looking to learn about somebody's experience relationally, how you might be looking to give feedback, how you might be looking for them to, take some kind of a relational action like, hey, would you mind hearing my perspective a little bit now is a version of relational action, you know, relational request, or create some kind of relationship design um, 
which is more like the governance out. That's like the, that's like, oh, that one goes to governance. Okay, if we wanna create some kind of understanding ongoingly about how we're gonna show up together as people, that's more like the relational governance, which is what we have a word for that. We call it relationship design. And we have a process for that also. So it's totally been a revelation, not just to have, not just to imagine how relational practice can make organizations, including self-managed organizations better, but actually to imagine how self-management philosophy and values, power shift, user agency, whatever you wanna call it, can actually be a nice frame or make, make relating practices even more digestible. Thanks, Josh. So we actually, I, I, I sense that that time we saved earlier, we can bank it for later. Uh, All right. There, uh, there are no raised hands and we're just at the top of the hour. So I think with that, um, typically in a live setting, I would ask everyone to join me in some applause to appreciate Porch and Josh. So if you would care to unmute yourself, and join me in some applause to appreciate Porch and Josh for joining us. For an icon. Thanks, I missed guys. that. I find that I missed that. So okay. thank you both so much. Uh, Bedrock Culture and Leadership, you can Google them. Uh, I'm so excited about our joint offering. And thank you so much, both of you, for joining me for this session. I think it was timely and relevant. And with that, I will bid all of you have a great rest of your day, evening, afternoon, weekend. We will send out a recording of this in case you want to review it. We'll also send out, uh, I think in a couple hours, you'll get a link to a very, very quick survey. We'd love your feedback and your suggestions for our next forum fireside. So until then, thank you all and be safe. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>